Hello friends, and welcome to The Hanged Man in the Moon. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm pleased to meet you. If you've been here before, thank you for returning. I'm truly honored. Friends, if you are a returning visitor, you probably already know that this is still the beginning of my one-year deep dive into the Thoth Tarot system, originally created by Lady Frida Harris and Alistair Crowley. And it's been a very interesting and um, enlightening journey so far, and it's only just begun. This is the third lunar, lunar cycle that I've really been focusing on this system, and yes, I consider it to be a separate system from the Smith Waite deck and all of its iterations, which also came from the Order of the Golden Dawn, at a little bit of a different time, with very different people. Um, but yes, the Thoth. I'd been hesitant to read publicly with the Thoth, even though I have loved the Thoth for decades. Um, I've always been very hesitant and um, nervous about actually putting it to use for anybody other than myself. And so this is me coming out of the Thoth closet, not saying that I am leaving everything else behind by any means, not at all. Um, I, my first true love is the Smithwaite deck and its iterations. That's where I, as they say, cut my teeth on the tarot. Um, and I love the Tarot de Marseille and the Continental Tarots as well. I love those and I'm not going to be tossing them aside for the Thoth, but I've now been able to claim my inner Thoth reader persona, Thoth reader self. Let's call it that. So, and this Thoth Reader self is still in development. It's still a work in progress. So we're, that's what we're here to do. We're here to explore the Thoth Tarot system together. Um, and I've got a whole spread all laid out for you, my new spread that I used in my last video. I'm going to continue using that for at least a this cycle, the next lunar cycle, maybe even a third, we'll see. If I get another bright idea, I might change, but um, I think I'm gonna be using this one for a while. And I've got the spread all laid out for us, but before we get to the spread, let me give you a little bit of a preview. Um, the preview for this spread is, success is a common. Energy is a common. If you've been, if we've, you've, we've been feeling um, a little bit I don't know, the beginnings of fall weariness and the urge to snuggle under covers and not move very much. If that has become prevalent for you in this next week, according to the spread, we've got some energy and some success coming our way. Um, and that success seems to be dependent upon and asking us to bring stuff together, to synthesize, to analyze and bring things together in order to find a wholeness for our success, which may not be a long lasting success, or it may be, we need to read the spread to get to that um, level of detail. But that's what I see at first glance. So friends, before I show you the, the spread, let me first tell you how grateful I am for all of you who have already hit the thumbs up button and who have subscribed to this channel because it's you who have helped this channel and help continue helping the channel to grow and develop and get the channel in front of the eyes of other people who might be interested. And I think that's the most important thing. If you're interested, hit that thumbs up button and it will put this video and this channel in front of the other people who might also be attracted to what we're talking about here. Um, so thank you for doing all of that. And in case you are interested in getting a reading from me, my email address is below. Shoot me an email to thehangedmaninthemoon at gmail.com. We'll get you a reading. Smith Waite, uh, perhaps Crowley, perhaps Terre de Marseille, your choice. So all of that stuff is all available for you. And if you want to see a specific video about a specific deck, also let me know in the comments below or shoot me an email. I'll try and accommodate you as much as I possibly can. So, 
That's me. That's what we're here doing. And these are the opportunities for you. And now another opportunity. We're going to look at this week's spread. So first, let me show you this, show you the spread right now. What do you think of that spread? Interesting. I think it's interesting. What do you think of the decks I'm using for this spread? I have to admit, I realize now, and I did not really realize it before I did last week's video. The two tarot decks that I'm using in this spread are out of print. One of the decks is a deck that was part of a set that came with The Mirror of the Soul, a wonderful book that I think you can still get. Um, but this particular deck is gone, to my knowledge. However, it's almost exactly the same size, I believe, as the mini Thoth that is available on Amazon. So you can get something very similar to this Thoth mini deck online still. Not part of the package as I got it. Although you can get it part of the package as I got it on eBay and perhaps even A Books, but it might cost a little bit more money. The other deck I'm using is very out of print. The Universal Tarot is a fascinating deck that some people would argue is not a tarot, but we're using it as a tarot. And if you're interested in the question of, well, why isn't it a tarot? Um, the creator has left the pages out of the court cards. Out of the So we've only got three court cards for each suit instead of four. We have a king, a queen, and a knight, which I'm going to be reading as knight, queen, prince, just saying, but they leave out the pages or in the Thoth deck, the princesses. And I gave you a little bit of that information in the previous video. If you're interested in see that brief discussion, go check out that video. I'll put a card up here if you want to go look at that one. Okay, so. Those two decks are out of print. The uh, I Ching Oracle, I believe, is, in, is available. The um, creator has a Facebook page. I haven't been able to find a website that actually sells them, but contact the creator on Facebook and you probably will be able to get this deck. Um, and I'll put that information in the description box below. So, friends, this spread. Interesting, right? Now, just in case you are new here, um, let me tell you what you just saw. There were five sets of two cards, and I'm calling this my five element spread. Four classical Western elements of fire, water, air, earth, and then the fifth element of ether or spirit. So the two cards in the center, the very, very center, those are for the fifth element of ether or spirit. Then in the upper left, there were two cards for fire. In the lower right, there were two cards for water. In the upper right, we had two cards for air. In the lower right, left, I'm sorry, the lower left, we had two cards for earth. So spirit, fire, which is our passions, our um, inspiration, our sexuality, water for our emotions, our intuition, our um, our our sensitive poet kind of creativity, and air for our thoughts, our vision, our plans, our ways of communicating and looking at the world. And then earth, our bodies, yes, our physicality, yes, but also the work we do in the world and our resources, the material stuff around us. Yeah, and that's the order that we're going to be reading these cards in. And then there were two cards at the Feel like an airplane stewardess. There were two cards at the side. Check the exits. There are two cards at the side that gave us, um, that will give us advice. And those are two cards from an I Ching Oracle deck. And I use that deck because, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Crowley was very, very interested in the I Ching and studied the I Ching and incorporated the I Ching in his deck. The the concepts, the ideas of the I Ching, particularly when it com comes to the court cards. Yeah, Crowley associates each one of the courts with a specific, uh, not te hex not trigram, but uh, hexagram, hexagram. 
So, there's all that. So friends, what are we going to do now? We're going to start reading the spread. Let's start with the central two cards of the spread um, for spirit, for the ether. Here they are, again. You just saw, from left to right, the Four of Wands and the Eight of Wands, right? A lot of fire here in the spirit realm. And an interesting doubling. Yeah, four and eight. That's also very interesting and in and indicative, I think, of this week's spread, in a sense. Um, there's, like I said, there's a combining that's being asked for, perhaps even a doubling. Um, and the Four of Wands is the card that we're going to start off with. A beautiful card drawn by Lady Frida Harris. It's lovely, right? Uh, we see here the circle with the uh, ram's heads for Aries and the... Uh, doves for Venus, because this is completion, and the Golden Dawn system places Venus in Aries for this card. Um, and when Venus is in Aries, in the house of Aries, um, the, there's a lot of passion and dynamism there. Yeah, w Venus is in the home of her partner Mars. And that there's a fiery, passionate, um, and dynamic relationship between them. It's not all um, it's not all calm and sweet between them. It's a dynamic, um, a very active, passionate relationship between these two. No, and yet the title of the card is completion, which is interesting, right? You see the fire in the background, right? The fire burning there is. It's small. It's not a huge burst of flame, but it is there. And because that flame is still there, this is not the, complete, the completion of, ha, ah, yes, it's all done and well, that was nice, wasn't it? Right? This is the completion that may satisfy, but... Nothing is going to remain the same. It's not a completion that is going to be eternal. This is a temporary completion. It's a completion where there are clear boundaries that are recommended. We want to put a border around this sense of completion and realize that, yes, we can enjoy what it is for what it is, but there's still, some, there, there's still a road to be, go, to be um, traveled. Right? So, there might be promises that have been fulfilled, which, is, which are wonderful. Um, the foundation for future progress has been laid, but that progress is going to uh, be one of change and transformation. So this is something, this milestone is something that is here to help us get ourselves together and prepare for the change and transformation that is coming. Right? This four of stability and order, but also of limitations. And that limitation, there's like an, an expiration date to this sense of completion, which is good because if, if we were to get stuck here and stay here in this sense of completion, we would move into stagnation. But we have a road in front of us that is going to allow us to change and transform, which is a good thing, right? So perhaps we don't have any intention to expend or modify the situation, but it cannot remain as it is forever. So if you notice that, okay, we've got that feeling of, I'm good, I'm going to stay here. We want to double check, right? We want to be sure that we're not becoming complacent in our completion. So, what is the card right next to that? Very interesting. The card right next to it is not the card of, yes, let's stay where we are. It's a card of swiftness, right? The Eight of Wands in this deck is very, is very swordsy. It has a very swords feeling to it, does it not? Now, the title is not here. The title Swiftness is not here, but in the Harris Crowley deck, the Eight of Wands is called Swiftness, and it's Mercury in Sagittarius. We're going to notice a lot of Mercury in this week's spread, and we're going to notice a bunch of Sagittarius as well. Um, 
Yes. Well, a little bit of Sagittarius. Anyways, that's coming up later. But right now we're here with the Eight of Wands. Now, Mercury in Sagittarius is upbeat, open-minded, easygoing. The natural home of, uh, the natural planet for Sagittarius is Jupiter. But Jupiter is, like I said, paired. Like Venus and Mars are paired. Venus is in the house of Mars when she's in Aries. Mercury is in the house of his partner, Jupiter, when he is in Sagittarius. And so Mercury is kind of upbeat and happy there, I guess. So this card brings high energy. Either, and we're recommended to either enjoy the sparks or wait for everything to settle down. We've got the choice. Now there's a lot of energy, energy, there are a lot of sparks here, and we can enjoy the fireworks. Or we can just mellow out and wait for it to pass. Personally, I think with this card here, the recommendation would probably be to enjoy the fireworks if we can. Yeah? This energy of high velocity is electric. And we can have um, heightened speech and heightened vision here as well, because there is a sword's feel to this card. And the, the, uh, the creator of this card for this deck points to that sword element of communication and thought running quickly, like Mercury, Mercury might. So something may have reached its boundary and is now splitting up a little bit. And so in the next sections of the cards, we're going to be seeing a recommendations to resynthesize. So in spirit, what do we have? We have this sense of completion, but in that completion, things are breaking apart and breaking apart like light passing through a prism, not like bricks from a building crumbling. Not the crumbling kind of breaking apart, but the splitting and the diversifying of a breaking apart of light through a prism, which is beautiful and lovely and full of energy. But if we don't want to stop there, if we stop there and sit and enjoy the lights, which we can for a moment. Now we do have the completion card here to give us that, yes, enjoy the lights where we are right now, but we want to keep going. We want to keep going, right? Yeah, this is a milestone. It's not the end of the line. So that's what spirit is. That's the information that spirit is giving us for us for the coming week, which is wonderful. This is good news. But if you were expecting a, yep, it's all done and I am the winner moment, this is not it. This is definitely not it. And hopefully we don't want to really feel that because that feeling will only last a moment or two, and then we'll get to the part of now what? Is that all there is? Right? Any success, any completion, we want it to be a milestone on a beautiful, magnificent, magnificent journey forward, right? Can you see that? Can you agree with that? I hope you can. That's, that's what living an intentional life is after all. You have the, the river of intention, the powerful current of intention that moves us forward is eternal. Whether we're in this body or co-creating another body in another lifetime, it is eternal. And that's beautiful and wonderful and expansive and powerful and abundant and all of those wonderful things. So take a moment and enjoy that is what this spread is trying to start off with. So friends, 
Let's move right into the fire section of this spread because we're leaving fire and let's see what the fire is speaking to us, right? We have a lot of fire in spirit. Let's see what the actual suit of fire, the actual, not suit, the element of fire has to say to us. Here are the cards. In fire, we had two cards. One is the lovers with Mercury again, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, and the other was the Prince of Swords, right? Well, okay, so it's called the Knave of Swords in this deck, but I'm calling it the Prince of Swords because we're reading it Harris Crowley style, okay? So we start off with the lovers. And you know what? When I just picked up the card, I got a little bit of a panic attack because later on in this spread, we have a hermit. And this lover card, this lover's card, I should say, reminds me of the hermit in a really, really weird way. Because the primary, the predominant image of the card is this large central figure. Now the lovers, which are smaller and down below, don't draw my eye as quickly as this huge, presider over the chemical wedding. Yeah? This, it's a beautiful, it's one of the most beautiful cards in the deck. One of the most beautiful major arcana, well, all of the major arcana are beautiful. Okay, never mind. This is a beautiful, beautiful major arcana card, the lovers. What do we see? We see the huge, huge figure in the center, which actually does refer to the hermit. This is the hermit here pre presiding over a wedding, a joining, a union. Now, and below we have the red, the gold king and the, I'm sorry, the, we have the king and the queen. One of them is gold, one of them is silver. Now we have the joining of two. We also have the two children at the very bottom, right? The white child and the black child. Reminding us of alchemy, reminding us of the Gemini twins, which this card is referring to, but also re reminding us of two aspects of Horus, uh, the child aspects of Horus, um, which is beautiful. And we also have, what do we have? We also have a white eagle and a red lion down at the bottom, which remind us of the art card. Now, in many ways, this card and the art card are also very tightly linked. And the red eagle, I'm sorry, the white eagle and the red lion become the red eagle and the white lion in the art card. Here's the joining of the male and the female component, components of sex. We also see the Orphic egg. Do you see the Orphic egg down there? No, it's right down here at the very bottom between the, at the feet of the two children. And the Orphic egg also appears in the Hermit card. So this card is also very closely linked to the Hermit card. And Crowley says the Orphic egg is a complete glyph of the equilibrium necessary to begin the great work being alchemy, right? The egg is the union of the male and the female, the spiritual essence yet unformed. So the male and the female come together and create the Orphic egg, which births the entire cosmos. We also have two statues on Cupid at the very top. Do you see them? Two statues of women and between the Cupid so one of these women, the, the statues is Eve and one of them is Lilith. Now the rivals of, for Adam's affection. And Lilith is also the one who's riding the beast in the lust card. Does not, the lust card does not come up this week, um, but the hermit does, just saying. Um, so we've got the union of, op, of opposing aspects here. Yeah, Eve and Lilith, the red, the red uh, lion and the white eagle. 
the two children of Gemini, the two aspects of Horus, all joined here under will. And on Cupid's quiver, I can't see it, but the quiver for where you, know, where you put the, the arrows, the quiver, is supposedly written the word Thelema, which is the religion, the uh, spiritual philosophy that uh, Alistair Crowley pronounced. And the key, uh, the key um, idea for Thelema is everything is love, love under will. So here, the lover's card, love, but under will. And the lover's card is attributed to Gemini in this deck, as well as in the um, Smith-Waite deck, which means that it's also the domicile of Mercury. So, mutable air's vital attributes enter our world here in the lover's card. Mutable air in fire. And we've got another air card right next to it. So we've got a lot of air in fire, which is great because air adds to fire. Air electrifies, energizes fire. So these two cards in the fire section are very, very powerful and they're po they give power as well. So let's get back to the lover card, lover's card. Sorry, my Tarot de Marseille habits are leaking out here. It's the lover's card here. And the lover's card connects Bina and Tipereth. So we get our um, wisdom connected to the heart here. The wisdom of the mother, the top of the mother pillar, connects us, connects to the heart here in the lover's card. And Crowley suggests here both anal analysis and synthesis, the dissecting of what we're looking at and then the recombining and bring it, bringing it back together under the wisdom of Bina, perhaps. And in Bina, we can think of Bina, it's a very interesting thing, just struck me, that the energy, the knowledge from Kether goes into Chokma, which is understanding, but it's unformed. And then that energy is received by Bina. And in Bina, it's the womb of energy where energy multiplies and diversifies and starts to begin to get a little bit of shape. Think of it like the womb of spiritual understanding is Bina, from which wisdom springs forth. So that analysis and synthesis, the Breaking things apart and then coming back together, together is a very bina activity. So here, broken apart, divided, and then considered before it can be brought together. And that could be for anything, for business, relationships, for self. Anything we want, we're putting our attention on can receive this kind of activity. And it also refers to the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkrantz. I'm sorry, Rosenkrutz. Rosenkrutz, the Rosy Cross, Rosicrucians. Christian Rosenkrutz um, goes, is invited to attend the chemical wedding of the Red King and the White Queen. Is that right or is it the White King and the Red Queen? Anyways, let's pretend that I know what I'm talking about and it's the Red King and the White Queen. Might be the other way around. Anyways. One of them is red and white, one of them is white, one of them is the king, the other one's the queen, and they come together and unite, and that's the alchemy of birthing the pure soul. Here is indicated in the lover's card. And that is joined with the Prince of Swords, otherwise known as the Knave of Swords, in this deck here. Now, this Knave of Swords is very different from the Harris Crowley Prince of Swords in that the, that prince looks a little scattered, whereas this Knave does not look nearly as scattered. We see the, um, the square and... what else is there? Yes, and the compass of the Masons framing this knight. So, this... Prince, this knave, has the foundation of alchemical Masonic knowledge. Now, Harris Crowley 
or Crowley, I should say, links this card, if we think of it as the Prince of Air, the Prince of, yeah, the Prince of Air, to hexagram 57, which is called Sun, which means flexible yet able to penetrate when focused. Good attribute for the Prince of Swords or the Knight of Swords. And both the Prince of Swords in the Harris Crowley deck and the Knave of Swords in this deck point to Aquarius. That's why I think I can, we can read them the same, because they're pointing to the same courtly zodiacal sign, Aquarius, which is the domicile of Saturn from which fixed air's vital attributes enter our world. Now we have mutable air here and fixed air here. And being the prince knave, this is also associated with Tipareth, which is beauty. The beauty of self-awareness, but also identification with thought, perhaps, which might be a little bit a caution. Yeah? Self-aware, yes. Revel in the beauty of thought, but don't identify with it. That's where our problems can begin. So we have thought, consideration, mindfulness, intellect, learning, and freedom indicated with this court card. Reason and knowledge not yet applied could also be possible. Yeah, pure intellectual in investigation, good at learning, but not so good at putting things that they learn into practice, which is a little bit of a trap for Aquarians. They could have focus issues as well. Um, not as much of a focus issue as maybe Mercury and Gemini would, but there's still a little bit of a focus issue here. So, one thing to also be careful of is opinions that might change at the drop of a hat. Now, the opinions might change in an instant. And it's a little cold here, so my snapper, there it is, in an instant. <laughs> Um, but yet we do have clear, progressive thought combined with the joining of after analysis synthesizing. So if those potential, pro potentially problematic aspects of the Prince Knave of Air with Aquarius, now, the potential for lack of focus, the potential for not putting things into practice, I think that can be aided and assisted by the lover's card where we, we do the analysis, yes, yes but then we put, bring it all together and begin the alchemical work of transmutation. So these two cards together in our fire, in our passion, in our inspiration, Add a little bit of thought to it, a little bit of dynamism, a little bit of a bit of vision, and the potential to create by reconstructing those elements which we've analyzed into a new form and putting it to work. And is that can you see how that could be something that we might be able to do in the environment of the Four of Wands of Completion added to by the additional powerful force of the Eight of Wands. Does that make sense? Can you see that? How this in that environment works beautifully. Now we've got some water to take a, pic take a look at. We have two cards in the water section of the spread, which is the partner and yet the antithesis of fire. Hmm? Let's take a look at those water cards right now. It's really interesting. We, I don't see a lot of con, a lot of conflict. Okay, so. I haven't really mentioned this in this video, but ever since I've started reading with the Harris Crowley deck, I've been also incorporating elemental dignities, which means that, for example, fire and water are ill-dignified. They are in conflict, just as air and earth are in conflict. 
And sometimes we'll get, for example, an earth card in an air spot or an earth card next to an air card and they are in, in conflict. And so we need to figure out where the conflict is and maybe use one of the cards to shift into a more dignified, a more uh, beneficial aspect, state, attribute, one of those three, or all of those three. But so far in this spread, we haven't had anything ill-dignified. We've had things that match very well. We had air and fire, matches very well. And right now we move into water and we've got two cards. Yeah, the eight of cups, not the happiest in the pack, but the eight of cups and then the universe. No fire. Everything is hunky-dory and air and, I'm sorry, water and air, they're fine together. They don't lift each other up. They don't squash each other down. They can walk very comfortably side by side. So, we start off with the Eight of Cups, which is this one, which is Saturn. Now, we'll have a little bit more Saturn in just a moment. Um, but we've got Saturn here in Pisces of all places. I don't know if you can see the glyphs here on the card, but um, right at the very, very top, there's a little white squiggle here, which is Saturn. And then at the very, very bottom, there's a slightly orangish Pisces sign. And Saturn does not like being in Pisces, to tell you the truth. Saturn is really happy in Aquarius, is really happy in um, Capricorn, and is in really happy in Libra, actually, where Saturn is exalted. But here, not so much. So when Saturn is in Pisces, we have weak boundaries. Saturn is all about the cutting things, dividing things, and clear boundaries. But that gets submerged in this ocean of Piscean water, and those boundaries dissolve, giving us the sense of indolence, the avoidance of activity. Because we're, we can't hold it together anymore, yeah? It's like you've got this really rigid salt. Let's put, say, salt. You put it in water and the salt kind of dissolves. It's still salty, but the boundaries and the shape have been lost. That's kind of what's happening here. So, in the extreme, we have hopelessness of desire gone wrong. We wanted to do something and it just went wrong and it's just giving up. <sighs> I don't want to do it anymore. No? Or we might have been caught in a shallow ambition. Yeah? On the, on the other end of the spectrum, instead of this high hope which is uh, of desire which has gone wrong, we, we might have been shooting too low. And our, our ambitions were so shallow that they didn't have any form or structure to begin with. And so we might have thought, let's just give up. Let's abandon whatever success we have achieved so far. We have the potential to, to, of abandoning, abandoning it, losing our interest, emotions starting to stagnate and become difficult to bear. Now, stagnation, that stagnation, which I said was a potential of the four of wands if we just stay there. which in the ether section, in the spirit section, was we got the boost of energy from the Eight of Wands. Here we have the Eight of Cups, which is, has the potential of doing what I was said was the problem. The potential problem of the Four of Wands. And so thank goodness these two cards were not together, right? But we do have this to contend with in our emotional sphere, in our intuitive sphere, sphere, that we still have that potential in the Four of Wands of Ether to slip into the Eight of Cups of Indolence and give up. 
Because we're not there yet, maybe? I don't know. Maybe. But we're paired with the universe. And this may be a reason why that we have that potential to be like, this is it. Because what is the universe? It's a beautiful card. In the Harris Crowley deck, we've got a woman dancing. Here, we have a whirling dir dervish, but dancing. And the universe points to Saturn, which is domiciled in both uh, Capricorn and Aquarius. So we've got cardinal earth and fixed air's vital attributes entering our world, entering our natal charts, entering the question we ask of the Tarot, which is how can we live more intentionally in the coming week? And we've got Saturn here in, the, in cardinal earth, let's get going, and fixed air. I'm, I've got this all figured out. And the universe card joins Yesod and Malkut. Yesod and Malkut, foundation and manifestation or kingdom. Now, Yesod is the middle, the bottom of the third triangle of the tree of life, pointing the second one pointing down. The first one points up, the second one points down, the third one points down. And this is the psychological or the um, etheric triangle, bringing us right into manifestation in Malkut. So the central, the foundation of the whole tree, number nine, points right down into manifestation to the kingdom. And that is, this is that path of completion, of successful manifestation. So, like I said, instead of a dancing girl in the Harris Crowley deck, we have a whirling dervish. What is a whirling dervish? The whirling dervish, the whirling dance of the dervish is a meditation. It's a meditation on love of the divine, of divine love. Now, the whirling dervish, and I don't think, I can't get this on camera, I don't think, but the pose is generally like this. So the arms are open and receptive. One is pointing up to the heavens. One is outreaching. The face is turned up towards the heavens and contemplating and feeling the presence of divine love. And the way to focus that is by moving the body in a circular motion, just like the universe turns and the divine will, the divine love turns on an axis of the monad, of the point of the all, which is the, un the unity, which contains everything and is the central point. If that makes any, does that make any sense? I may not be expressing it well, but here we do have that whirling dervish, which is echoing and a symbol of the whirling universe. First, we have the whirling planets of our solar system, and then we have our solar system whirling in our galaxy, and the galaxy is whirling in the universe, right? So this is the manifestation of the divine and an emanation thereof. It's the coming together and ending of all things, ready to create a new beginning. It's synthesis. It's completion and beginning. It's elements now in balance. So there's a set structure and a format from which the new will emerge. This is the final arrangement for that Orphic egg to burst open. And we don't really have an Orphic egg in this one, but in the Harris Crowley deck, we do have an Orphic egg. We have the serpent spiraling as well, which could be Sophia, the, um, the divine feminine swirling into manifestation. And perhaps it's time for a well-deserved well rest. Yeah, we, we got this foundation. We could take a seat here and not stay. Because if we do that, then this becomes a problem. But this can be the solution to this, right? So, perhaps it's because we are here and we've lost our... And because this is in water, we've lost our intuitive 
understanding, we've lost touch with our intuitive understanding that this is just a moment of completion and we're not stuck here. And it can't get stuck here because the world doesn't end. <laughs> I mean, the universe doesn't end. It's a, it's a step in the eternal expansion. And yet, maybe we're distracted. Maybe we're emotionally disconnected with our intuition, which tells us that we still, we're, we're getting ready for the new, for the burst, for the, the thing. The thing which was indicated in spirit, which was the Four of Wands completion and the burst of energy of the Eight of Wands, right? Right? Maybe we, we've, we've lost a touch with that. So if we are feeling that sense of, is that all there is, then that's because we've lost touch. And so the spread is reminding us, hey, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. You don't need to dissolve in the, in the unconscious. Get it together. We're on a journey of, eternal, of eternity together. You, me, the divine, that person you hate, that person I hate, that person I love, the person you love. We're all in this together. So, that's our fire and water, right? the lovers and the Prince of Swords, and then the Eight of Cups, but the universe. So take this moment of pause, of completion and manifestation in, and dance in it rather than going into indolence. Do the dervish instead of the, 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 the dissolving. Get it together and dance. So friends, let's take a look at the air cards for this week's spread because they're interesting. Here they are. Okay, so in the air section, we have a little bit of ill dignity, just a little bit. Let's take a look at it, yeah? On the left, we had the Princess of Wands. On the right, we, which is fine, Princess of Wands. Then we had the Two of Discs. That's a little bit of a problem. But let's start with the one that's not so much of a problem, yeah? Let's start off with this beautiful Princess of Wands. Isn't she gorgeous? Look at her, uh, how she flows with the fire there. Now, she is Earth of Fire, but she is burning, right? She's flying. And the, um, her, Crowley, Crowley, you see those two things streaming from her head, which could be hair? Yeah? The two things which are streaming forward, the, going forward, like her braids are going in front of her. Interestingly, Crowley points to those and links them to the feathers of Maat, uh, not of Maat, of um, one of the Egyptian goddesses of air, of air. So this being a fire card in the air section of the spread is fine. Fire and air work well together. That indication of air in, the, er, in this fire card are, is beautiful. And Crowley points to hexagram 27 for this card. 27, it's um, a person omnivorous of passion, reckless in attaining gratification. So this person, this card is, a, could be a, is potentially dangerous. We can go overboard with the Princess of Fire. Now we could ride that current smoothly or we could turn into a what is it from the Bugs Bunny uh, cartoons? The a Tasmanian devil of too much passion, too much uh, desire for gratification. But the Princess of Wands is ambitious, aspiring, full of enthusiasm. 
sometimes a little irrational, but, but powerful. Don't get on her bad side, though. She will not forget an injury. Yeah? But she's brilliant. She's daring. She's courageous. And she must be aware while the passion burns. Keep the head and the eyes focused. So we don't go off, off into the bushes and start a forest fire. Right? There's a bright spark of an idea here. She can generate something new, novel. But she could also be a little bit hyperactive. So we want to keep clear, keep aware, not get, go out of bound, not go, what? Not get out of control. Stay focused. And then we're, we're, we're a powerful being. And this card is paired with the Two of Discs. Now, the Two of Discs, now, we had the Princess of Wands here, which has no zodiacal sign, because the princesses in the Harris Crowley deck have no sign. They're just the element. Which is actually why the creator of this deck decided to leave out the pages, or the princesses, because... He sees them as like a redundancy of the aces of the suit. Yeah, so he just wanted to keep the zodiacal court cards in and take out the extraneous, what this person saw as the extraneous pages. Anyways, so here we are with the two of discs, which is change in the Harris Crowley deck, which puts Saturn in Capricorn. And here we've got Saturn in Capricorn. I don't know if you can see them, but um, see this glyph here, right by my finger, that is Capricorn. And then this planet here is, believe it or not, believe it or not, Jupiter. It's Jupiter in Capricorn. Did I say Saturn? I meant Jupiter in Capricorn. So we have Jupiter in a pl place where he's not that happy. Just like Saturn was not happy in Pisces because that's supposed to be the house of Jupiter. Here, Jupiter is not all that happy because he's in the house of Saturn. So, Jupiter becomes conservative. Mature and driven. High confidence. But there, there are he feels the boundaries that are set by the Capricornian, the Saturnian house. So what do we have here? We have movement and change. Change develops in harmony with the present situation, including constraints and opportunities. So there are opportunities in Capricorn, there are constraints in Capricorn, and Jupiter gets in there and is able to move them forward with but Jupiter is expansive and it's good fortune and that expansiveness and good fortune are tied down here in Capricorn. Jupiter may be able to unite the elements that may have been opposite, opposing people, opposing expectations, opposing aims. Jupiter can unite them here. And to Crowley, the good fortune of Jupiter is limited here. Jupiter aligns with the wheel, change, but within the existing limits of Saturn. So, we've got this. But again, this is ill-dignified with air. It's ill-dignified with the... in this spot. So, maybe we're feeling too constrained. We want, we want to move, we want to change, we've got a lot of indications of that, but the constraints may be uncomfortable for us here. In, and there apparently are constraints which are mental con constructs because it's here in the air section, right? So we have a lot of potential luck, a lot of potential fortune and expansion, but we feel like the situation, the it's just tying us down and maybe it's that 
it's an aspect of the completion. Not like somebody else is tying us down, but we got this energy and the drive to move forward, and yet we're in a place of the Four of Wands. And maybe that's where that feeling of being constrained is, that completion is, can be constraining. That's all settled. And so maybe, just like the Four of Cups in, I'm sorry, the Eight of Cups in the water section of indolence, potential for laziness, we might have another potential for feeling tied down, which would definitely unsettle the Princess of Wands. She'd say, burn that shit up, right? We don't want to burn the shit up. We've done a really, we've had a really successful completion here. We don't want to burn it up. We want to appreciate it for what it is and be prepared for the next, for the movement forward, for change. And if there's any burning to do, it's the burning of our feeling of constraint, right? Does that make sense? So friends, we've got two cards for Earth. What are we going to do about all of this? What is the work? How, how does it manifest? Let's look at the Earth cards right now. The two cards we have for Earth are, from left to right, another princess, right? The princess of discs. We've got Earth and Earth. Yeah? And then we have the hermit which is associated with Virgo in the Golden Dawn decks. And so we've got more Earth. Beautiful. Earth in Earth in Earth. Wonderful. The only thing that was a little bit ill-dignified, like I said, was that two of discs up in the air. <laughs> two discs up in the air. Reminding me a little bit of the uh, Smith Weight deck of the two of coins, or two of pentacles, I should say, um, where the juggler is juggling those two pentacles, two discs up in the air. Sorry, moving right along. Um, so, Princess of Earth, wonderful card, and one of the most important cards according to Crowley. Yeah, um, this, is where, this is where things really happen for him. And it's the last card of the deck um, for his, in his mind. The Princess of Earth, which is Earth of Earth, which according to him is hexagram 52, which is Khan, which is keeping still. It's mountain over mountain, body at rest. So the princess is manifestation at rest. The queen is manifestation, the queen of earth, the queen of discs is manifestation in motion. The princess of discs is manifestation at rest. So the current situation is pregnant with possibility. Ending one lifestyle is the beginning of another. Just like you see this princess beautifully, beautifully uh, adorned princess with the helmet and the shield and the spear. At the tip of the spear, there's a diamond. Yeah, can, let me see if I can point to it. Do you see this diamond here at the bottom with the energy rays pointed down into the earth? The, the Here, the princess is channeling universal energy to manifest into the material. And you see that light, she beams energy through that staff, through the diamond, into the earth, and that glow illuminates her face, right? It's just a, it's a gorgeous card. It's an absolutely gorgeous card. So, from the dark... She's standing in relative dark, from the dark, light. And from the light, dark. Yeah, the split of duality happens here. Change is in progress. We want to make sure that we check our old patterns. We don't want to carry our old patterns into the new. Our fixed habits or our old ways of thinking, they want to be recycled and renewed. The princess is all about becoming aware of a secret wonder. And that secret wonder is that she is the mother of the next generation. She is the new queen. She will, she is growing into her next role as new queen and becoming the mother of a whole new series of trees of life. 
Now, because Earth of Earth is the very base, and her next step is to create the new fire at the top, the mother of fire, with the prince who will become the knight, the father of fire. Fire of fire, knight of, of a wands, the fire of fire, the princess of discs, the earth of earth, will become the queen of fire, water of fire. So she's, she's birthing a new universe, and she's prepared to birth a new universe. She's, and she's willing to let the old go to be able to move into the new. But right now she's at rest because it hasn't happened yet. And she is paired here with perfect pairing, right? The hermit, especially in the Golden Dawn system where the hermit is associated with, um, with Virgo, which is the domicile of Mercury. Right? We had Mercury up there in uh, the Eight of Wands with, in Sagittarius. And here we have Mercury again. So who is the, hu her the humit, <laughs> the hermit? Well, the hermit, be Mercury in Capricorn, gives us mutable Earth's vital attributes entering our world. Mutable Earth. Nice pairing with the princess of discs, with the princess of Earth, Earth of Earth, if you ask me. And the hermit connects Chesed and Tipreth. Chesed, loving kindness with the heart of, and beauty of Tipreth. Perfect, wonderful pairing. It's associated with Yod, the... Um, the Hebrew letter for the hermit is Yod, which is the first letter of the holy name, the unpronounceable holy name of the divine Yod Hed Vav He of the Tetragrammaton, right? And the Yod is the hand, the hand of fate, the creative hand. The hermit has creativity here. Also, because Yod is, a, so, is linked with the rune Naudis, which is desire, need and innovation, right? Disruption and the desire to overcome that disruption. It's necessity being the mother of invention. And the hermit is creative in the Crowley deck, the Harris Crowley deck. But the hermit here is creative too. You can see the hermit here holding the lantern, right? You can also see the snake around the Orphic, which was around the Orphic egg, wrapping itself around the hermit here. Wisdom, knowledge. But you can also see that huge spermatozoa here, which is, there's also a huge spermatozoa in the Harris Crowley deck. This huge spermatozoa with the Virgo at the head. So this is a very sexually, sex, sexually magical card. Asking us not to be moved by external stimulus. Keep silent. Like the princess of discs. Seed is here. Here. Seed. Fertilization. Gestation. Like the princess of discs. Retirement. Not stopping work, but st stepping back from society and current events to give attention to who we are, where we are, and what we're doing. Our solitary pursuits are going to be more effective here. Going it alone, not getting involved with other people's crap. Yeah? And it could also be practical plans from introspection. We look within, we get a practical plan that will carry us forward for the next stage. But here we are in completion. Remember, we started with completion that milestone. And in that milestone, in that area of completion, which is energized by the Eight of Wands in spirit, we look within and we see the practical plan that will move us forward and be able to harness that energy of the Eight of Wands to create, to gestate. And we do it on our own right now. Other folk may, may join us in the future, but for, for right now, we're going it alone. We're doing our own thing. 
and not getting ourselves dragged down into the potential of the Eight of Cups of Indolence, recognizing that this completion is the beginning, not the end. It's not the, the we don't have to create the, is, is that all there is? And loop that energy we've got, just let it leak out into a puddle of mush. That's the only thing I think I could think of. A puddle of mush. Keep it together. Enjoy who we are, where we are, and begin feeling where that energy is going to be moving us for in our next, in the next leg of the journey, right? This is a wonderful place to be if we allow it, if we fully inhabit it with our true nature. Feeling the powerful flow of intention through us and around us. Now we have two cards of advice from the I Ching deck. Let's take a look at those cards right now. What do you think of the art on this, in this deck? I love it. Do you? I really hope that you are interested in this deck and reach out to the creator and see if you can get one because I think it's, it's a beautifully done deck. And, you know, Benabel Wen has a new I Ching guidebook out as well and maybe this deck would pair very nicely with her guidebook, I'm just saying. Anyways. So, I mean, the creators of this deck also have a very nice, easy to process, easy to understand um, guidebook that is beautifully created and goes very nicely with this deck. And yet, if that, so what I would say is, get this deck, get that guidebook, play with it, experiment with it, explore it. And if you start to feel a resonance with this system, then get Benabel's deck, I'm sorry, Benabel's book, which will give you, just like Holistic Tarot gave you the encyclopedic knowledge of all that is Tarot, her book on the I Ching will give you that for the I Ching. So maybe start off slight, or if you're the type that wants to go whole hog and dive deep right from the get-go, if that's what really gets your interest sparked, do it that, that way. But let's go back to the cards that we got. We got a very interesting two cards in sequence, the four and the five, which I didn't notice right off the bat because these numbers are fairly small on the card. I saw the titles and I didn't really notice the numbers until I went back to look at it clearly. And then I saw, oh my God, this is four and five in sequential order. Interesting. Um, and the first card, Discovering, Hex hexagram four, pronounced Meng, is mountain over water. Now, when you think of discovering, it might not be exactly the same kind of discovering that you're thinking of. Here, discovering is enlightenment or revelation. The waking up, yeah? It could also be initiation, interestingly. Yeah? Uh, the initiation of the spirit of beginner. Now, this isn't the discovery of mastery, but rather the discovery of the entrance to a chamber of wonders. Now, that moment of enlightenment is not the end of the life, right? We, if we are blessed with that moment of enlightenment, then we would discover an entirely new way of being and living in the world. We become the new, the initiate, the new discoverer of the world who discovers from this new perspective. Wanting to learn and having the courage to begin. Aware, aware that any obstacles that there are are part of the learning process and are to be appreciated. Have you ever looked at an obstacle in front of you and said, Thank you. Well, that's what this card is here to tell us. Patience is called for and trust in the face of challenges. 
So this Discoveries card is not a card of clear open roads with nothing standing in our way. This is the, the initiate that knows that there will be obstacles, there will be challenges, and those challenges are what will help us learn. Continued activity can lead to positive outcomes here. So that's where we begin. That's the advice that we recognize that where we are here now in this moment of completion is the opening of the door. It's the awakening. And that there will potentially be obstacles in our way, for example, the feeling of indolence in the Eight of Cups. Yeah, maybe our two of discsness, our conservative natures, our um, the or the boundaries that we feel around us might make us feel like we're facing another obstacle or a constraint. But we can give thanks for that, for being aware of it, because if we notice that we are bound and restrained, we know that there's something else out there too. So. As initiates, we discover our way to pass through, above, over, around, whatever that is, whatever that constraint is. And then the next card is waiting. Because yes, we're here, we're discovering, we're initiating. But this is not the time to move ahead. We're in the Four of Wands, right? Completion. So it's really important, it's uh, significant, that this waiting card is hard on the heels of discovering that yes, you've gotten there, but wait a minute, hold your horses. This isn't the time to go charging ahead like the Princess of Wands might want to do. This is the time to just take a moment. Believe that things will get better. If they're good now, they will get better. If, they, if you feel uncomfortable and constrained, you see the, that obstacle right there in front of your face now, it'll get better. This is time to sit tight and let things unfold naturally, which is difficult with that Eight of Wands energy perhaps running through us. If there are difficulties or uncertainty, they are temporary. That's what this card is here to tell us. So, we're here. We're the initiates. We're, there's something new. There's something that we are discovering. There's, there are revelations at hand. There's, um, we are learning. And yet, hold your horses. Don't get, don't get ahead of yourself. Take a moment. Because in spirit, we're here in a completion moment. We've completed the journey to this point. We've completed the opening of an initiation, perhaps. Yes, we feel the energy wanting to, wanting to move through us in the Eight of Wands and the Princess of Wands. But there's a lot of fire there. But wait, just wait. Be present to where we are, like the hermit. And don't be moved by the external stimuli. Be present and aware, knowing that in that presence and awareness, there is sexual magic and not only fornication, but sexual magic, the, the, that root chakra pouring through the sec second sacral chakra, that energy magic is available to us and vital for us of creation. Does that make sense? That's where we are. And I still haven't hit... I haven't hit on a title yet. I'll figure it out in a little bit. But this is the end of the video. So friends, thank you very much for joining me on this journey through this spread and for joining me on the journey through my year of initiation into the Thoth Tarot as a public tool. Thank you. You give me energy and strength and help me in this path of discovery. 
And in gratitude, now as always, I wish you love, joy, well-being, and pure awareness. Thank you. Thank you.